Yeah, I'll introduce it. One second. I hate pushing for you know? Can't tell if I got this right or not. It's really... I was not really trained. I was trained in it, and I wasn't, so... Well, this one's going to one more minute. <laughs>
What we're going to do is wing it because we had a DVD presentation going, but really after Gordon's presentation, he set up so many questions that we really feel that we can just wing it and we'll deal with your questions, but regarding our new model. And this is a model much as Gar was talking about it. We don't know what it's really going to look like, but without an idea of where we're going, we're operating chaotically. We're not going to be able to uh, talk with computer. people if we aren't ourselves just convinced computers. that there's a better way that we can live together. And it does have a lot to do with values, and it does have a lot to do with hope, and it does have a lot, of, lot to do with the idea that we can solve our problems once we get rid of the basic underlying issues. One of the basic underlying problems, competition, <coughs> profit, a lack of cooperation, uh, all the, you know, all, all the evils that we have to live with every day in our culture as well as in our economy. So we're going to try to carry on with what Gar was introducing and you'll probably have lots of questions that you weren't able to get all of your questions into uh, Gar's talk because, you know, we're time constraints unfortunately. So we'll try to uh, answer your questions and we've passed out some cards if you think of questions that they don't you know they don't you don't have an opportunity to ask them right away maybe you can jot them down and get to the questions when we have a, a, a real committed question and answer period and just one comment on that please uh, if you could write your questions down as we're going along if you find something that bugs you or you don't agree with or anything, just write it down and then after this is over uh, we'll answer questions. We'll try to. So rather than interrupt the, the presentation uh, where we have to go and answer a question, get off track, just write your questions down, or keep them in your head, and uh, save them for the end. Okay? Is this presentation on your website as well? <laughs> PowerPoint? Uh, this presentation is on. We're going to put this on. I have a question. We're going to put this on. Still in the process of developing the website. But we do have a DVD that is the complete package that we would we're going to present today, which is about 40 to 45 minutes. This it's is a mini college course. This isn't that long. This no. is the shorter version of it. Our original DVD goes into the history of anthropology, societies, how they were formed, the kind of systems we lived out in history. Uh, cap the history of capitalism, the wage system, how exploitation takes place, and then a vision of a new way of structuring ourselves. But we're just going to concentrate in on the vision of how we can structure ourselves and leave the history and all that because we assume that it's going to take that would take too long, and you're probably pretty well schooled in, in those ideas anyway. And if you will. Uh, put your name, uh, email address, address, physical address. If you would like the DVD, we will certainly send you out a copy free. We would just like to have it distributed and shared with as many people as possible. You may want to deal with it as a book club uh, where you have a discussion group that comes up and talks about the ideas. Because one of the things that we discovered is without a discussion with that DVD, it really doesn't help very much because it leaves you with a lot of stuff coming in and you really don't have that feedback possibility. So if you can get a discussion group going, that would even be best. And so no. that's available if you write on the back of the book. So what we're going to show you is not written in stone. It's not solid. It's, it's an idea. And it can change, but it's a basis to begin a discussion. And that's the idea. <coughs> I'm going to be operating this thing from over here, so we'll, I'll be walking around a little bit. Actually, when you boil it all down, as Gar presented today and last night, it's our belief that capitalism is the cause of most of our problems. Pollution, bad housing, you name it, we've all lived it, health care, whatever. The profit system is the basis of why we can't have real democracy where we live and where we work. So the system has to change. And we're going to leave it up to other people right now to talk about how that transition might take place. But what if it went away tomorrow? What if capitalism disappeared? We were just left to run everything ourselves. Well, the secret is we run everything. 
thing ourselves anyway, every day. We, the 99%, the working class, go out, we run the buses, we run the schools, we run the factories. We don't own them. We don't have decision-making powers. We can't actually tell the uh, company what to produce, but we, ma we manage them, we work the machines, we work the equipment, and we make the society hum every day. So it's just not ours. So therefore, we're infinite into as to what we can do as how we want to live, how we want to work, how we want to structure ourselves, our governments. We know we want democracy. All kind of democracy. Where does that democracy take place? So when we are talking about our problems, time and time again, all of us, when we talk about our problems, we all have very simple solutions. But if you present it to your, you know, your boss, or if you talk about it to your congressman, or your senator, or your president, what comes back? Oh, you know, yeah, that sounds real good, but it costs too much. I mean, that's the bottom line to every, every question that we offer about how are we going to live better? That, yeah, sure, good. That costs too much. Uh, so pollution and health care and education and transportation and infrastructure, the environment, <coughs> everything is based on can it give us back enough profit? And if it can't, sorry, we can't do it. And we as a country, as a world, have begun to adopt that as you know, we've internalized. There's no more <coughs> people say we've internalized their values. Cost too much? Okay, we can't do it. We'll do the next best thing. Of course, the next best thing is not the best thing. And so we have to really rethink how we solve our problems. And we cannot solve our problems based on cost. We have to do it in terms of health, safety, well-being. Uh, imagination, innovation, creative problem-solving, progress. Under capitalism, and you can call it corporatism, I don't care what you call it, because I know a lot of people kind of cringe at the word when you say capitalism too much. But that's that's what we're living in. But if you want to call it corporations or however you want to phrase it, okay. But whatever whatever we call it, we know what we're living in. And if the answer is cost, we're screwed. Because yeah, doing things the right way costs. Something. Of course, we also know that doing things the wrong way, which we're not, we're not privy to, we don't ever hear about the side effects and side costs of how doing things the wrong way is so expensive. You know, we're kind of are beginning to be aware of that now. Beginning to be aware of how our values and our pollution and our environmental issues and our health care, our prison system, everything is costing us a lot. But that's sort of like, yeah, that's hidden. That's, we don't talk about that. We only talk about if we can make a profit on it. And we shouldn't be internalizing that. Those are wrong values. They're not human values. They're capitalist values. And capitalism served a good purpose, but it's getting to the point where it is really being a destructive force. And we have to recognize that and own up to it. Yep. So we can talk about old ideas how we used to do things, how we do things now, how we want to do things, which we call the transition, and then get to really new ideas. And the new ideas are really going to take us from where we are to where we want to go. And, you know, we're going to discuss where we want to go. But basically, almost like the fellow who asked the question about where does the spiritual come into all these values? Religions have all these spiritual values. But you know, if you come down to it, most religions share very basic spiritual values, and I think most humanity shares those basic values and spiritual beliefs. So when we go to the new, we're not quite sure of what it will be, but it needs to be based on those things that we all believe in. So let's replace capitalism with social, economic, and political democracy. 
That's our role. That's what Gar was saying. That's the challenge of the next decades that we're just sort of setting the seeds for. We need a new way of doing business. Pardon the pun. <laughs> but that's the truth. We have to think in a new way. And attacking our problems at the branches, which there are an infinite amount of, we have to start to attack the root of the problem. And that's what do we replace capitalism with? Because if we don't have a plan, if we don't have a vision, the right wing will supply that vision. This is what happened in Germany in the 30s. The workers wanted change. They were suffering from the depression. But they didn't have a plan. They didn't have a vision to go to that could show up to the, their fellow workers. So guess what? Hitler and the capitalist class supplied that vision. It's called, they called it even national socialism to fool the workers that it was a, some sort of a socialist idea. But it wasn't. It was state control of the corporate uh, power and uh, facilities. It's called fascism. And we could descend into a, a fascist state tomorrow, as Gar was saying. We don't know where this is going. So if we don't have some idea as leftists, as progressives, that we can say when someone says, well, what are you going to replace it with? Well, here's some an idea. Here's, you know, this is what we have to start, we think, to have in our minds. Some sort of an idea. So we're going to talk about that idea. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, can you define capitalism as you're speaking about it, and also kind of capitalism and fascism, so that when you're talking, you need a bit of a frame of exactly what you're talking about. OK, I'm talking about capitalism, where the 1% own all of the means of production in the world. And we, the 99%, have to sell our labor to them, our labor power, and we are remunerated by a wage, which represents only a portion of the value of the product we produce. That portion that we produce, that we don't get back in wages, is called surplus value. Or profit or profit, net. They just have to take out expenses for, or they're gross, they still have to take out expenses to run the factories, that's net. But the fact is that our surplus value is being confiscated in the hands of 1%. And if that was released, as Gar was pointing out, right now the potential is $200,000 for a family of four for everybody in the United States. But we don't have that, do we? No, because $150,000 of our surplus values goes to the 1%, and we live on $50,000. So that's capitalism. So it's how's that different for, than fascism? Well, fascism is merely a state-run <clears throat> or state-controlled uh, capitalist system. It's a combination of, of the state, a strong dictator, militarist, usually backed up by a strong military, to make sure the workers get in line, take pay cuts, any rebellion is squashed. It's a, it's a militarist uh, capitalist society. Where we're chained to our desk. Or, but it's, it, it integrates the state and the corporations. In other words, it's a melding. And what do we have now? Yeah. We're the same thing. We don't call it fascism. You know, we call it crony capitalism. We call it corrupt Congress. But the point of fact is that we are in a state corporate collusion. They work together. That is why it is called a system. The word system implies a totality. Values, behavior, beliefs, governance, Community, everything is involved. It's not only economics, it is the totality of what we live in. And that's why when we did our DVD, we called it Reimagining Now. Because when people talk about the way we live now, 
They don't say capitalism. They don't say fascism. They say, well, it's just the way it is now. They call democracy. Yeah, they, 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 unfortunately, they call it democracy. <laughs> <laughs> so we make what, the world safe for capitalism. Right. I mean, yeah. so we, Africa is yeah. the next comment to be democratized yeah. and made safe for democracy or, or market capitalism. Africa is the next big horizon. They're already in there at ethnic cleansing and everything else to prepare a groundwork for factories the raw materials to be extracted and used. We see this happening in Congo and so on. So it, it's going all around the world. Capitalism has to grow. Capitalism has to grow. It has to expand uh, or it dies because of competition. If, you don't, if I don't expand and cheapen my unit price, as Barr said, you will. The other guy will. And I'm out of business. So I'm compelled, I'm compelled to be competitive where I die. That's, that's the ethic of the Okay, what is economic democracy that we're talking about? Let's imagine capitalism's over. We own everything. No more 1% is 100%. The 1% has a fate worse than debt. They have to work for a living. <laughs> part of all of us again, and they go in and we would do our jobs. Uh, maybe only 10 hours a week. Maybe only five. Maybe only five, and get back the full value of our part. So what is an economic democracy? An economic, social, and political unity where the tools of production and distribution are owned not privately owned, but owned by the society, by all of us, run and administered democratically by all the people in their communities, in their communities, just like Gar was talking about, based on the community, and the industries, workplaces, we decide everything. So what we're gonna have is communities made up or a system made up of communities all over the country. Maybe not even have state boundaries, but just communities. Gar talked about some regionalism. Maybe it could be an original idea, but made up of communities where our needs and desires uh, really start to be uh, expressed. And then uh, we also have industries that produce our things. Remember he was talking about the Boeing company and the big airplane. How do, you, how do you do that? Well, you have industries in our society that we run. And we go to, we not only live in our communities, but we go to work every day. And we can work in a health care industry or an energy industry. Or, these are some examples. And all of our information will be fed into a elected, democratically representative coordinating. Remember he said, you're going to have planning about who's going to do it. Well, we have a vision where we, the people, do our own planning through elected representatives that are subject to recall in a moment's notice, through computerization. We can find out what our needs are, what resources are available, and we can start to plan how we want to do things. We decide everything. I think also Gore was talking about the vote. Um, in a society where you get a vote, that's part of the democratic process. But where we ask the questions, where we pose the question that we vote on, that becomes a more complete democracy. So we have to we have to be thinking in terms of democracy in a totally free human way. I think it's important to say that when you say we decide everything and you have the word distribution up there, yeah. we also would decide how the surplus is distributed. Absolutely. And the surplus in, in a new society, you know, surplus here is profit. Goes to people we never see. Uh, they make decisions about what they do with their profit and it's usually to make more profit, which Again, leads to all sorts of problems about growth, unnecessary, unwanted production. You know, I mean, it's, it just goes on and on. We would take 
what we would call there our commonwealth. And that part of it would go to our commonwealth needs. So would we have taxes? Well, in a way, taxes, we all know, we need to pay taxes. I mean, for society, we need to have some basis for funding all the social needs that we have. So yeah, we would have the, the wealth would be, yeah, it would go to people, but it was also, we would also give back part of our production, part of our wealth to social needs. How would you, uh, what do you have established for the voting system? Well, we're going to get into that. Maybe this one is a little bit about that. Can I just say uh, one thing? Please ask all these questions at the end. Right. Write them down now because we're going to go through all these things. Well, I think there's give and take. So right. I, I don't mind if you ask the questions. Okay. But we won't spend endless time, but maybe I do. <laughs> right. Answer one question. All right. Uh, in an economic democracy, all industries, services, and communities are represented. In this model, a Commonwealth Congress can be used, can use accumulated input from all the communities and industries to help coordinate production to satisfy all of our individual and community needs and desires. This new interactive economic and social democracy would bring together the information, talents, and technology to solve problems create a better, healthy place to live, work, and raise our family. We not only make all decisions, we formulate all the questions, too. This is going to be an interactive situation with feedback from industry, from communities, into a commonwealth coordinating Congress, and then back to the industries for production and communities for using what's produced. So we would do it through community meetings, we would do it through computers. We all use the computer daily. We what can text we, it in, you know. Yeah, what if, what if we were to be able to use computers, large screens, we have community meetings, maybe we have, you know, four community meetings going on at the same time, and we have interaction going on, because we have video technology. I mean, you know, they talked about video technology. I don't know how many years. My father used to talk about, someday we're gonna have a picture phone. That was back in 1930 he talked about it. <laughs> Uh, we finally got a very poor Skype, but you know, we're getting there. So we have opportunities, even in this very limited framework under capitalism, again, always geared to how do I make money, not so much how do I improve human life, although again, as Scar said, yeah, that comes in. How do you determine a winning vote? A winning vote? Well, well on, a community, on, a, on a community meeting, Whatever would come up with the majority. And I do think that there'll be prioritization. And you know, we could keep records so much more easily. I mean, we've got the technology to really have democracy. We never really had that before. We do now. Uh, interactive governance. That's sort of another term we can talk about this. Democratically organize, coordinate, and make intelligent use of our goods and services. No bureaucracy is possible because of job rotation and instant recall. No bureaucratic power is possible because governments only coordinate information. You can't build a power structure. That's where the bureaucracies are set in. When there's power, those bureaucracies go to the vacuum of power. So we have a interactive system of where we live and where we work. Sometimes we live and work in the same place. I know. Uh, I do that. I work and I'm in my house. But it is productive. Uh, all of our information, our needs, and how our industries are going to be run, administered, and, and what's going to be produced, etc., are decided on those levels, but also are fed into the Commonwealth Coordinating Congress, which coordinates all of these needs, raw materials. You know, when Gar showed his little sketches, one of the things that I noticed that he was doing that we have not done, that we do differently, he was almost connecting in one circle community and work. And we've really set up a model where the two parts of our lives, where we really lead and, and 
we have different needs in those two parts of our life. And when, where we work, what we do with our work, doesn't always fit in with what we do when we get home. We might need something for our kids at home. When we're at work, we might need to be considering how many hours we work, uh, you know, the, the labor involved, uh, the difficulty, the uh, materials that are needed. I mean, it's a whole different world, and yet connected because we're inside both of those spheres. So in our model, we thought the best way to be able to really have an interactive, balanced economy would be to separate those two, almost like we have two uh, parts of the Congress, you know, we have Congress and Senate. Well, in ours, it would be two bodies, one representing work and one representing community. And the interaction would take place between those two spheres, both important. Does that make sense to you? Because that, to me, always made sense. Because I know as a worker, I was doing one thing and I was totally consumed in what I was doing there. But when I got home, I had a, a whole other life that I was also very involved with and concerned with. And they didn't always gel. So we felt, well, one way to be able to handle that would be to have a community, which would make up the, <coughs> the children, the working people, yeah, but, you know, older people, young people, college students or students. And then at work, a whole other set of criteria when we would meet around the table as workers. Needs and desires from our communities and industries are coordinated at the grassroots and implemented to create a true economic democracy. All right, take the data from our local councils, Congress can coordinate resources and production based on our input and feedback. We can plan the manufacture and distribution of all the goods and services we want and need together as a society. Unlike today, where competition for profit limits solutions, and it does, this dynamic and balanced social economy, planning and production will be free to serve the people. Without profit, we will get back the full value of our labor and all we create as a cooperative society. That's important. We will be living in a cooperative society and we will share as a cooperative society the goods and services we collectively produce and we'll do it equally. We'll tell you how. This is basically a graphic about voting. We could very definitely we could vote paper ballot or hand raising or whatever where we work and the community for council meetings. Um, we could vote for representatives. These are the kinds of things that will you know if this uh, society that we're thinking about doesn't need physical body representatives. We're not sure about that. They may only be needed. But if, if we needed make ba basically ideas to be represented, maybe we wouldn't need physical people to be in these positions. I don't know. But we could vote for representatives, which would be able to voice what their people back home uh, were talking about, uh, both at the both the workplace <coughs> and community. Um, and they, the vote could also be done through, as I was saying, <coughs> through the computer. Uh, local workplaces would feed representation into an industry coordinating council that we were really talking about uh, one industry. Let's say education. Education is an industry. It produces something. You never know if you're going to pay those teachers, but we do. So uh, the larger, either regional or you know, even larger areas, would feed into, feed that information to the community coordinating council. If, for example, teachers needed more books, they would send that information up, down, sideways, whatever you want to call it, over. And in the community, let's say parents were saying, well, I don't know if kids need more books. Um, I kind of think you need more playground equipment. They would send that information up, over, sideways. The coordinating would take place at various levels. Prioritization would take place at various levels. But ultimately, there'd be feedback between what can be produced and what's needed. Right now, we don't really go by what's needed. 
corporations decide on their own what they want to produce. And we're kind of sitting there swallowing it all or rejecting it. With this idea, the needs are prior both at the work site as well as in the community. The needs are prior to what we produce. All right, community governance. We're talking about the community, where we live. All right, let's take a local community someplace in America, Madison, maybe smaller, maybe bigger. We can define that. I'll tell you how we can define it. But uh, in every community, there's elements in that community. If you work, if you live in Madison, there's a, a council on leisure and recreation. There's that need, the education, the housing, infrastructure, so on. All this is things that are part of the community and have needs. Maybe I'm a manager of the Little League team this year and I need more baseball. All right, I feed this into my local community council, elected by us. Notice these arrows, feedback, going back and forth. These are not, these are subject to job rotation and represent, represent to subject to instant recall. If some guy's not doing his job, we're going to recall him tomorrow if he's not doing it properly. It's up to us to decide. We'll make those decisions. So uh, the decision power comes back to where we live here in this idea. And then that information goes to a community's coordinating council. There's other communities. This is one community. There's other communities over here. And they all have, they go in and let's stay in a region, there's 10 communities, we'll have one community's council, uh, coordinating council for 10 communities. And then those 10 communities put in their request or information or uh, data into the Commonwealth Coordinating Congress and they allocate how we're going to do this and then it goes back to it's always a feedback. It's not a hierarchy. That's capitalism. Hierarchy. More, more organic kind of a structure. Same thing with industry governance. Where we work. Let's take a fact. Let's say you work in a uh, food factory. Most factories or most industries, let's say take an industry, have a design department, a research department, assembly, package, all the parts that go into, into that production in that factory. All their needs in one area will be registered with their local workplace council, feedback again, what, are, what their needs are, how they want to do things, work week, anything that comes up. Subject to recall representation. They put their input into a, an industry coordinating council. Let's say the food industry all around in a region, a whole region, would be inputting into that industry coordinating council. And then that information would be coordinated at, at the Commonwealth coordinating level. You know, where I taught, we use something that was said to be so revolutionary. And it was a concept of a team approach. Well, now it's quite common. And again, these are these transitions where capitalism and the way we live, let's put it that way, you don't like the word capitalism. The way we have lived till now um, has created these very unworkable problems where there's a boss and other people are grumbling because the boss won't listen and I have a good idea and he won't listen. So a, a process was developed, I guess it was Japan's quality circle that had to do with it back in the early 80s, late 70s. It was introduced at the college that we worked, it was called the team approach. And what we did was we rotated jobs. There was no, there was no chairman, there was a team leader. And we would each have to be a team leader. We all learned the problems of being a team leader, organizing, coordinating, calling meetings, finding out why Fred said he was going to do something and he didn't. <laughs> so instead of getting angry, we began to see, you know what? It really does take a team and a commitment to do the thing that we said we're going to do to get the job done. And so really this idea of uh, no 
uh, no solid, you know, stable bureaucracy. It really comes out of this idea of teamwork. And it would be job rotation would be the basis of our governance, job rotation. But also job rotation would come into play because we have so much more opportunity to develop ourselves. Job rotation would also come into play in our own lives. I think, for example, many people after 10 years in a job kind of begin to get a little stale. So job rotation can take place in another sphere through learning and you want to go and try something new. Uh, as long as that job is needed, go for it. Um, so job rotation and the idea of flexibility, the idea of more time uh, to develop, these are all part and parcel of these values that undergird a new model. In an economic democracy, participation will be based on our real communities and workplace, not represented as it is now on artificial geographical boundaries. No more gerrymandering. You know, the reason we have states, that came out of the old agrarian form when we first were a country. The colony of Massachusetts became the state of Massachusetts. Rhode Island colony became the state. And so they were based, the river went here, so we'll, that'll be our boundary and so on. But in our interactive high-tech age, we don't need this. We don't need that. We can just have a series of communities. Maybe they'll be regional, as Gar was talking about later or earlier. Maybe they'll be broken into regions, environmental considerations, etc. But I can see we could just we would just be represented by communities and industries that we're all working in and managing and using for our benefit. And I see it as the industry fulfilling the request of the communities, that it all comes at the community level, what our needs and wants and desires are. And then we have industries where we work in also that supply and manufacture the goods and services that those communities want and need. So uh, that's one idea. <laughs> so this new society, although you know, it sounds complicated when you're talking about this council and this interactive and you know, voting and having. It sounds complicated, but actually it's a very simple system. Because as soon as you do away with competition, and as soon as you do away with profit, and as soon as you do with uh, authoritarian controls and hierarchies, you've simplified the process that we all now see each other as equals. We're people. We all have needs. We can satisfy those needs if we cooperate and you know, do our best to see each other in each other. So it really is a simplification. And on the other hand, today, under capitalism, there's so much planning that goes on. There is so much uh, organization that we, again, are not aware of because we're not really taught to look at and analyze the way in which we're living and the way in which we work. But if you analyze it, there's so much planning that goes on. It's crazy planning. <clears throat> it's short-term planning. <clears throat> it's, it's planning without vision. It's planning based on values that are dangerous and unhealthy. But it is planning. Governance and representation. That's sort of do a little comparison thing. In state capitalism, today we elect representatives to Congress based on an old economic model, the agrarian state. But the overriding concern of Congress is to protect corporate profits and markets, which are not confined to states of geography, but operate internationally. Our governments today, federal, state, and local, do not represent our interest, the 99%, but those of the owners of industry, the 1%, who spend billions creating the legislatures they want. This corruption, in both, and both political parties are actually part and parcel of the capital system. It's systemic, as Garth said. In an economic democracy, we'd have grassroots and direct input and no permanent democracy. And that's a whole different idea of governance. Well, Garth, you said also that we have, we're producing our wealth to that family of four. Every family of four can have $200,000 a year annual income. This would never happen because of capitalism. But that's how much wealth we produce. There's been studies done, and actually the wage that's set out by each person 
each wage that we that we are given, that we receive, the wage really is represent represents only about 20 percent of the actual wealth that we produce. That's why we don't get $200,000 a year, and we never will, not under capitalism, because it's it's already siphoned off by the owners who do all the control. And you know, again, ownership. You know, we talk about investors or, you know, gee, we must have, this must be an ownership society because there's investors and we all have investments. And what we really have to remember is that although people may have investments in corporations, the, uh, the decision making is done by those who control the larger share of interest, the larger share of, of, uh, of shares. So again, we have really, we have been screwed by capitalism. For 200 years, it worked, it worked well. I mean, we were able to really advance as, as, as human society. We you know, built up a beautiful, a beautiful amount of material wealth. But in the last 50 years, in particular, we can see how bad the system is working against us. We are just not, well, I mean, we can talk about wage stagnation. We actually have declined in wages, and there's reasons for that. Capitalism is becoming more and more capable of squeezing more and more profit out of what we produce and, and the wealth that we produce. They're getting very, very good and very efficient at taking that wealth away from us and giving it to the very few. Let's just sort of compare capitalism with economic democracy, and you can read these off yourself. But we're talking about unemployment in crisis, down to corrupt financial systems, wealth and power in the hands of one percent. And it's a hierarchy, it's a pyramid. The power's at the top and it filters down to us at the bottom. The decisions, the wealth, everything. In an economic democracy, it's a certain democracy where we live and where we work. Rational production, no unnecessary duplication. Talking about saving the environment, how about the duplication of products we have on the market or capital? No plan to obsolescence and waste. Products last and recycle. No longer producing things that are harmful. Balances needs with resources and the environment. Full flex employment, short work week and rotation. No speculation, usury, or interest in the financial system. We'll get to that in a minute. Wealth and power in the hands of the, all of us. We're all going to share. We're all in it together, as Gar said. We're all in it together. That's what the new system has to be about, that we're all in it together. Again, capitalism produces negative values. Talk about culture. Gar was talking about a culture. We also have to develop, besides just a, a democracy and the economic, we have to start to build a culture, internalize how we're going to interact with each other. Look at the value system of capitalism. Greed is good and unique, innate. Then it, it's, it's part of human nature to be greedy. You're an animal. You're going to kill one of the other animal. Dog eat dog. That's in the value system that's produced by capitalism. We internalize it. We believe it. It's an ideology. Competition, dog eat dog. Only the rich are important. They are the wealth producers. The wealth, you hear them every day. They are the wealth producers. Without capital, you can't have jobs. They're right under capitalism, but not under economic democracy if we own the means of production. Corporations are people. Mm -hmm. Exploitation is natural. It's the way it's been, it's the way it's always been. Someone's always going to exploit someone else. The weak will be exploited by the strong. These are values that you have to have to live under a capitalist system. If you don't internalize these and operate by them, you're going to be a loser. A loser for debt term. Let's look at some of the positive value systems that might come out of a community-based economic democracy. Em empathy for others. We're all in this together. My time is as important as your time. 
I care about you, you care about me. We're going to relate to one another very differently. <clears throat> Cooperation and working together. We cooperate, cooperate every day when we go to work under capitalism. The workers do, or else we would be fired. We have to get along. But here we are really making it a value. We might teach this in second grade or first grade, kindergarten, about cooperation in a part of our education system. Each person, in, each person is important and contributes to the whole. I'm as valuable as you are. What do you do? I'm a garbage man. Or I'm a doctor. Well, who's more important in society? We'll talk about that in a minute. Caring for the future and the planet. These are positive value systems that we can have to start to build in an economic democracy. And again, the reason that we wanted to come to the convention is because there is a transition going on where the positive values are supplanting the negative ones. And we see that transition happening. And it's possible that it will keep going and get stronger. The more the system doesn't reflect our needs and can't answer them, the more we're going to find ways that we can answer those needs for ourselves. But again, without a vision that is bigger, a vision of where we want to go, a vision of what, can we really have a real democracy? Is humanity capable of that? If we don't believe it, if we don't hope for it and don't believe it, we're going to be stuck in where we are. Okay, markets and choice. We believe the myth, we do, we believe the myth that capitalism is the best of all possible systems. We've heard that from day one. Because of markets and choice. But markets and choice have always existed on some level, even in primitive times. In all economies throughout history, whether it's called shopping or consumption, it's always existed right alongside production. We not only are producers, we're consumers. I'm a consumer, but I'm also a producer. A market is simply a way for people to satisfy their needs and wants, a way to distribute a method of exchange. In the earliest days of human societies, prior to money, we directly exchanged using barter and trade. If I had something you wanted, and you had something I wanted, we could exchange it. That's a market. Later and still today, we use an abstract exchange, money. Money was an improvement over bartering because I could take the money, which was abstract, and then barter for anything, not whether I could find a willing partner. In an economic democracy, while we could still have markets and choice, we would use a more universal length exchange. My labor time for your labor time. In fact, capitalism limits choice. Economic democracy expands it for everyone. And we're going to get into this labor time and how we can exchange our labor with each other so we can all have the same access to the goods and services that we produce. And, and this, this idea of labor time is probably new to most people. Um, it's, it really does require a leap because it requires a fundamental understanding and belief that my time on this earth is as valuable as your time on this earth. So that time is something that we all share. It's something that we all uh, feel very uh, precious about. It's something very important to us. We all die. We all give birth. And so what we're talking about in this new society is a very, very big change in the way in which we think of a market, the way in which we think of what we do and how we contribute and how we get back something that we want from others. And we use, in, in this new system that we're thinking about, time becomes a kind of, uh, the, the, the modicum, the mo mode of barter, the mode of transfer, the mode of distribution the mode of exchange. Let's look how that may work. Under capitalism, we use the term supply and demand. You've heard that, economic 101. Supply and demand. Demand is equated with money. If you have enough money, 
you can demand or buy what you want. In a profit-based economy, need has nothing to do with it. I might need a new car, but if I don't have the money, demand, I can't get it. So it's a missed way of thinking. Under capitalism, artificial demands are manufactured, such as advertising, status, etc. We split this around in an economic democracy. Instead of supply and demand, it's need and supply. We turn that equation around. What we need and want, we supply. No waste, no duplication. In a profitless economy, we exchange the full value of our labor for the full value of others. Let's look at it a little closer now. This is important. Let's just take the use of technology today, which is getting more and more speeded up, more and more robotized. We're going to be laying off thousands of workers if they can bring in the robotics. They're going to be on the unemployment lines under capitalism. All technology represents accumulated past labor. We did make that. Under capitalism, all technologies are used to replace workers and increase profit. In an economic democracy, technology will become labor-saving devices for less work and more leisure time. So we can reduce our workloads with new technology and still get the benefit of what that technology produces. Today, if the new technology brought into a factory, the workers are laid off, and they don't benefit from the, what the new technology produces. They're only scrap people. How many folks might disagree with you, my own that? Mike, me? Who would? Amish. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, all, all the... All of reality is made up of very many bits and pieces. So, yeah, we probably make uh, generalizations. Uh, well, I mean, culture. The culture is more important than either of that. The culture in terms of values? Yeah. So they value what? They, they value, value hand labor over They value technology. the things they value, their community. And their, you know, in, in, a, yeah. in another another kind of more democratic, open, flexible society, we probably will be able to decide if we would like to use our hands more, mm -hmm. we could probably decide to do that. Once the technology would be free <coughs> from the profit motive, we'd be able to use technology to do the and things that we want technology to do. If you want to make a, go but, back and make a barrel by hand like an army, which a lot of people do, that's or a wood product, go ahead. You're free yeah. on your own time. Yeah. Go but home and make it. Better ways to well, I'm not saying that. Yeah, I'm not no, saying it is yeah, or yeah, not. Yeah. No, no. I'm just saying that because I think what's missing from this equation mm -hmm. is um, is the cult of personality. Mm -hmm. You know, because I, I mean, I'm a firm believer after reading lots of studies that we are really different from those other people. What you know, we're genetically what different what other from from the people on the right, from the people who have distinctive because they're part of the society. Yeah, too. of course. So if you have rotation of leadership, for example, you have two people who will rarely agree with each other. That I mean, I believe in rotation of leadership, but how how frequently if they can be rotated out in, a, in an instant? Or um, so you know, I think that the cult of personality. Well, I think all societies and all systems, if we have a group here of 35 people, we have to spend a month together here. Right. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna sort out. Uh, who's a leader, who isn't, uh, who's not doing their bit, who, who, you know, on a small scale here, mm -hmm. which could be a workplace, these things are going to work themselves out, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think we have the capacity to do that. And I really, I, I really think that when we talk about, let's talk about Tea Party leaders. If you really speak to people who have these beliefs, you know, very, very conservative, I that you, because I have, and I, I know I fall into this category, I agree with a lot of things that they say. Uh, you know. 
I don't agree with their solution, and I don't agree with what they see as the reason it happens, but the outcomes I agree with. You know, there's, there's many things that I think we would agree with. You know, socialists, which is basically what we're talking about, and no one is supposed to use that word, but it's a great <laughs> word. Use it. Use it or lose it. Use it or lose it. You know, there's, there's a conservative quality to socialism. You know, we want to conserve the very best of human nature, the very best of our, our world. So we are conservative as well. Uh, you know, you can listen to a lot of conservatives speak, and many of the things that they say make a lot of sense. But again, what we want to always come back to is what is good for people? What is good for humanity? Not theory, not ideology, but what do we really need as people? And there really aren't that many differences. I, I agree that personalities come into it. Yeah, you know, some people talk too much, and some people don't talk enough. <laughs> but basically, with all, within all those differences, we still we usually can have a dialogue and, and respect one another. So I, I don't think that there's that much genetic difference in the right and the left. I think it's a, the way in which we've been exposed to certain ideas, you know, our upbringing, our experiences. Um, you know, if you've been uh, beat up a lot on the job market, uh, you might be very, very angry and you might go for some reason. And without knowing the reason is capitalism, you might blame it on your neighbor. So there's, you know, a lot of the problems that we see as, you know, innate human nature, yes, but it also has a lot to do with the way the social fabric has, has knitted us together, and it's not always in very equal ways. Uh, how would you <coughs> take care of situations where some people work harder, faster, better, and some people we're going to get to that. Some Can you hold that question? Yeah, hold, uh, that's an important hold, question. That's coming right up. Yeah. 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 It's an important question. Can you question just hold these questions? Yeah. Yeah. Just hold it all Just hold it. Okay. We're talking about a new ideas about work, too, in this system. No hierarchies in jobs or in the workplace. All of our labor contributes to a whole. Everyone's time is as valuable as anybody else's. We should be able to choose in a lot of different careers in our working life. We can choose flex time, job rotation, job sharing. Our work should be creative, rewarding, and maybe even fun. We're going to get to these questions that you're asking. They're important. Because they're important. In an economic, oh, uh, how do we get paid? Medium of exchange. Under capitalism, it's money which is an artificial reality, an abstraction. Uh, it can be manipulated and inflated by printing more. It can be hoarded without producing wealth. That's, the, that's how it operates today, capitalism with money. In an economic democracy, the medium of exchange is time. Exchange based on a true value, real time. It can manipulate or inflate can't be hoarded. My eight hours are as valuable as your eight hours. And we're gonna, we can switch off our products because of that. How, why is time the medium of exchange in an economic, economic democracy? Because time is the universal measure of reality and common to us all. We all live, we're born, we live, and we die. That's time. Go through life as a time. Fact. Labor time, the new medium of exchange. Okay, this is important. This is how we're going to get paid. This is how we're going to make this thing work. Embodied in every object made and service provided is a certain amount of socially necessary labor time. I'll explain socially, socially necessary in just a minute. Labor time, physical and mental. When you work, you use your physical body and you use your mental power. You as a worker can exchange your labor time, electronically recorded on a personal time account card, we'll say, for any other goods or services that embodies in it an equal amount of labor time. All right, you may make computers. And you put four hours into making your product that you're involved with. 
you can exchange those four hours in a store or a market or exchange and go and shop if you want to and find something that embodies instead of a price tag, there'll be a little tag that says four hours, 10 minutes, 30 seconds. You can then load your basket up, go up to the checkout counter, take them out and put it up there. She rings it up. It's a total of 17 hours. Here's my time voucher card, my debit, time debit card, whatever. Take it off my account. And that's, this is full value for value. No profit, no stimming. This is where you can have the full value of our time. These, uh, let's get back to socially necessary labor time. Those goods and services that we determine in our councils, in our workplaces, in our communities, are, that are wanted and needed by all of us, as opposed to time you devote to your personal pursuits. Maybe gardening isn't socially necessary to the rest of society, but on, we're going to have so much free time, you can do anything you want in your own time. We're just talking about how we're going to produce for all of us here with the socially necessary time idea. And it could be that you'll make one of those wooden crates yeah, maybe maybe you'll make uh, art. We're artists ourselves. We're painters. In my own time, I paint. She does too. Healthcare. Let's just take one example of an activity in society. When you go to the hospital, who's more important in the healing process? The doctor. The nurses. The technicians. Medical waste people. The fact is, all contribute to the goal. What's the goal of getting you better? They're all important. Without any of them eliminated, with any of them eliminated, quality of service deteriorates. So again, as Gar said, we're all in this together. We're all producing the product. And we're all valuable. This might be the most revolutionary, radical, conflicting issue when we talk about a new society. What about people who work slower? What about people who require more training? If we're working in this, if we're working in a society where our education is included as part of our work, it's, of course, it would be taken care of by society because we will benefit from that education. Those people who are doing the doctoring, they wouldn't go into it because they make more money. They would do it because they would love to do that. The medical waste people, you might think, well, who the heck would love to go and be a medical waste collector? Well, you never know. I mean, as a, you know, my son said, yeah, but who's going to collect the garbage? And I, you know what? What would be so bad about collecting garbage if it was, you know, clean and safe and, you know, healthy and all and, that? And you were... It would just be work. It would be just another job. And I know I, one of my favorite jobs that I had in my life was in putting slides into a slide holder. I was trained as an artist, I was trained as a teacher, a professor, but one of the most satisfying jobs I had was this completely non-taxing, non-mental, non-stressful, just putting things into order. I, wow, that is so good. Now, I don't know how many years I would like to do that, maybe, maybe only a year. That's more job rotation. But that's job rotation. 17 minutes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so all of the jobs that we think of as being either highly wonderful, by the doctor and lowly, they might all be looked at very differently if we were paid, if we were remunerated on an equal basis. 15 minutes, 15 minutes. Fast worker, slow worker, we would all contribute. And we would actually be able to develop ourselves in our own way. It wouldn't be based on how much money we're going to get as a status thing or as a a training thing. It would be based really on our own inner core. 
Some people are fast, some people are slow. Some people do fast jobs well, some people do fast jobs poorly. Some people rush, some people do things very slowly and quietly, and, and that's good. So all of these factors, the things that make up our universe, all our differences, they all have value. And we shouldn't be expected to prioritize and put standards and hierarchies on all of these things that really are making us human, because we are diverse, we're different, we're fast, we're slow, we're quiet, we're noisy. What happens if <clears throat> you don't get enough doctors because they, it's, it does require so much more training, does require so much expertise, so how do you handle that? I, I'm a retired I, yeah, I think that all of these things become part of human human experience. If, for example, now surgery and so much of the medical professions are done by computers. I mean, they're done by technology, lasers. And, I mean, there's all sorts of surgical You still have to process. know how to use those. Absolutely. Training. Right. But I would think, yeah, training. So, Training. What you're saying is that the only reason that people today become involved in professions that require a lot of training is because why? I'm not saying it's the only reason. But no, but if it's, a, if it's the reason that you're saying, well, what if we wouldn't have enough people who'd be interested in doing that? What is the motivation of those people today? Money. Money. I mean, that's not a very good motivation for anybody to do a really good job. So I think, again, all of these things to me, they would all be, they would all work out. I mean, we're, we sometimes we set up problems that really don't exist. They would, they would work out. We're human beings, we would work it out. I believe that. I'd rather uh, have somebody that, that knows what uh, they're doing rather than that wants yeah. money. I was going to say, none of this is really exactly no, new. Sure. We see bits yes. of this everywhere. You look at Cuba. Cuban doctors aren't paid a lot of money. And Cuba has more doctors per capita than any country in the world. France also. If you and go to France. and they're, not paid, they're not paid a lot of money. Right. You look at, you'll find elements of the councils and things that, um, yes. in Venezuela. Yes. You know, I mean, none of this is reinventing the wheel. There are bits and pieces of every single thing you've talked about today in other countries that are doing a better job in those sectors that have incorporated these kinds of systems. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not really creating something brand new, no. because other places are doing bit by bit. Right. No. And Cuba has great you. doctors and a great system, and they don't make money, but they also don't have debt. Yeah. Well, to pick up on that remark, I was intrigued earlier when you started laughing at the mention of the term socialism. Your description of economic democracy and much of what you're presenting is very clearly based on Marxism. Is this a strategic decision to avoid mentioning Marx and socialism? Well, strategic possibly in the sense that if you if you use terms that people react to without really having very much basis in, in their own readings or in their own research, but they react to viscerally uh, Marx. Sure. You know, and then right away it becomes, you know, uh, Russian communism and that. Yeah, I mean, there's a, I think the left has become very cautious about using these words because they've been misled and misused and, you know, twisted to become, you know, loaded. horrible words. They're loaded terms. Yeah, they're loaded. So, you, you know, you might say <coughs> strategic sound like, you know, we're, we're no, I meant tactically. tactically. I wasn't asking it in a confrontational yes. way. Yes. Yes. As a Marxist, I'm just yes. curious. Yes. Is it simply, hey, you can't handle the truth? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think this group. I, yeah. I think we need to be loud and proud yeah. about these things. I just read you, but I tell everyone, when, when I think about it, I say, every single country is a social center. Yeah. Get real. Yeah. We turn over our money and we expect some services in common. That's socialism. Yeah. The United States is a socialist enterprise. Every nation state is a socialist enterprise. <laughs> Think about it. I mean, it's that simple. The only thing that's different is that we don't have the control because the control we we yeah. have allowed others yeah. to take. But from I mean, us. To, to take the bite out of yeah. socialism. Yeah. I don't say socialism. I say 
You pay taxes. Yeah. I like you get services. Yeah. That's socialism. I like to use the term. We're re we're for real socialism. Right. Yeah. Or no democratic socialism. socialism. <laughs> no and in terms of your, socialism. Answer your question first. I think there is an element to that. I think we want trying to present some older information, update it, and make it palatable for people today. Without the loaded baggage. Without, and, and without the, with all the loaded baggage. Oh, that's true. That, 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 is one of my, that was one of our motivations. Well, maybe, uh, maybe five years ago, what we're saying now is no longer necessary. Maybe now we can really talk about socialism. We can talk about Marxism. We can talk about you know, new democracy and, and not be misunderstood. And that's, again, I think it's this transition. I am going to be, if I add right, I think I'm 68, maybe 69 in a few days. And in my life, never, never, never have I heard the word capitalism and socialism used as frequently and as openly as it, as it is now. So, and ha when did that happen? Thank you, Occupy. In the past two years. What did Thank you, Thank Occupy. You, Occupy. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, the tea party. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And the idea that Occupy <laughs> presented to America, <coughs> it was globally, they kind of had that already, but in America were a little slow. Occupy pulled all those single issues together that we've been fighting singly. And you might say we've almost been fighting, we haven't been joined in that fight. We kind of, I'm fighting you because you're not doing what I want you to do, and you're not, you know, you're not fighting global warming, you're fighting uh, uh, jobs or, you know, something, unionization, whatever. But we really, right now, because Occupy really galvanized the, the, the country, they gal it galvanized these various issues. And Marxism always talked about the system. Marx always talked about and now analyzing the system. But when I was growing up, and maybe, you know, I'm older than you are, when I was growing up, I grew up during the McCarthy era, and we were not allowed to talk about system. If you use the word system, my God, if you use the word capitalism, I mean, you were ostracized. You know, you were, you were really, you were pushed aside. You were disliked. You were, you were dangerous. And so, yeah, maybe I'm, you know, I'm older. Maybe I have to, I have to become a little bit more uh, stronger in my understanding that it's okay now to use those terms. And I used to use them more than I use them less, and maybe it's time to use them more again. Are we on the questions? Or? Yeah, sure. I guess so. <laughs> so I've evolved so, that way. Okay, well, I'm interested in the, the shadow side of competition, because we are mammals, and if you look at the uh, mammal kingdom, it's all about, uh, you know, reproductive fitness and blah, blah, blah. Uh, so it, it seems to me that in this more ideal, friendly, that there's going to be some kind of power thing that's going to go on. That just maybe you're tossing up that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I have some. Uh, <laughs> I think there's good competition and bad competition. When you're competing out there every day for your bread with another fellow human being, it's a dog, it's a bad competition for your life. If you're competing with other people for your livelihood, to me that's a bad competition. A good competition are sports, athletics, uh, competition really in anything, games of all sorts. That's that's a good competition. And then we do have that the competitive idea. And that's part of being a human. Uh, it's just how we are, how are we going to manage it? For instance, in a workplace, if someone is very competitive and aggressive, well, it's up to the rest of us in our councils to bring that out to you. Maybe that person needs to go to a little counseling or something. I don't know. <laughs> Calm down, Joe, you know. Uh, you know, we're going to have ways of thinking. And we do have ways of thinking. I think we'll sort it out as you can And you know, the science for years, again, when I was raised, the science was always, you know, my brother in law, my sister, my first brother, they were in the sciences. And the sciences taught everybody that competition was the way in which humanity and, you know, the human race has evolved into this, you know, mighty force. 
But we've discovered now in more recent studies of genes, more recent studies of, of you know, the way in which human, humanity has, has survived, cooperation was what it was about. So again, transitioning from we are all about competition to no, you know what? Cooperation was a big that's, factor in human survival. So that's the transition that's that what I think we're, we're going to get on to here in a minute. Yeah, um, I'm curious, in your, in your first slide here, okay. uh, you show arrows going between industry and services down to community and back up to the industry and services. And then you show each of those spheres uh, interacting with the, kind of the CCC. Okay? Mm -hmm. And now, I'm concerned that uh, if, if that's the case, couldn't the messaging and the decisions become confusing. If I'm if I'm a if I'm a community member and maybe I'm on the community board or something, okay? And I call Joe up here in industry and services who's on the board of industry and services and say, hey look Joe, we need this, that, and the other side of here. And Joe says, okay, listen, we'll do something and, and then and then uh, alternatively someone sends a message from industry and services to the CCC, and, they, and I couldn't, this all become very confusing. It could be. I'm glad it doesn't happen in, in industry and commerce today. and government today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. so, I mean, but, but this is a problem, I, of course. You know what? Human communication is a problem. Yeah. I would say it's probably our biggest problem. Mm -hmm. But it, be, it is a problem that we all have to face and deal with. So, yeah, those kinds of things are going to happen. I mean, you know. One of the we, things, the way I get away, <laughs> if I had to vote there, the way I try to get away from that problem, is I have print out copies of everything. You know, I have a, you know, there's it's no misunderstanding what I sent you. You know, I, didn't you get that my email? Well, no, I didn't. Well, there's a printed copy of it. You know, that might be one way. But sure. Well, that's the way we do it. It's just human yeah. communication. Uh, also, it's what's to prevent the CCC from becoming a bureaucracy in yeah. or a power center? Because Let's suppose they, we're yeah. the CCC for five of us. Yeah. And I say, hey, I'm going to protect you from being recalled. And I'll protect you from being, you protect me, and here's what I'll say to them, and then blah, blah, I mean, uh, what's, what's well, the prevent some sort of illusion? Right. 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 The deity. No, I mean, again, realizing that these things are possible, we would have to figure out ways to make sure that those things don't take over. I mean, they begin to happen, become accomplished liars. You know, we could yeah. <laughs> just like story. Well, that was the story. Then, then we, we, we can just, you know, maybe we're like Gar said. We don't know if this is gonna ever happen. Yeah. We might destroy the planet Earth. We might kill ourselves. Yeah. Are we human beings no. capable? I like your idea. I, yeah. I, I, That's the question. Are we human idea. beings yeah. capable of pulling this off? Yeah. yeah. We and might we not be. Feel, we feel that we don't at least discuss this and get real about it, and yeah. get real about what to we answer your problems. Question, you know, one thing I would say is, problems. since there's no power in this, bureaucracies are, are ways to protect power bases. Well, you, you put protect, a bureaucracy in front of yourself, right? But since you don't have power, and you can't even get it, because your eight hours is worth my eight hours, yeah. we were equal in power. So you're just performing a coordinating function. And, and if you don't like your residing here, do something else. And we'll be working in bribery. I think I might have had the bribery. There's no bribery. I think I might have had the next question, but you know, no, I, I think this yeah, gentleman yeah, had his hands up. I was just going to plead that we get through the slides. We have eight minutes left. Oh, okay. I want to hear your presentation. All right, thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll take some questions. Well, actually, yeah, the card. Two, okay, two little quick points. Going to your question. It comes to accountability, and that means us citizens holding people like you, right. if you're in this group, accountable and not expect you to do it. Mm -hmm. That's been the problem. Yes. 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 Not to say that you personally, but you're just a servant. Yes. Yes. You are responsible to me and to the rest of us. And as to discharging or dis, uh, dissipating the charge, the nature of the term socialism, the fact is we have corporate socialism. Right. It already not just the socialism man that you were talking yeah. about, that we do get yeah. some basic services, 
But the fact is, we have corporate socialism, and that's why we're in the state yes. that we're in. There's capitalism for the rest of us. Right. Capitalism yeah. for the rest. Yeah. Socialism, socialism for the rich. Capitalism for the working class. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> the transition has already begun. I'm talking about trans, <laughs> trans uh, As Gar was saying, he was encouraging the development of buying cough, worker costs, home unions, community banks, local currency. These are all processes that could lead to where we want to go. I mean, once people experience a different kind of democracy, and, 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 and but they're reforms in my opinion. I don't think they're the ultimate, but they might enlighten people and take the pressure off the current of the pain away from the effect of And even if those enterprises fail, people have practiced something and that practice becomes embedded. I mean, it's just like, you know, if you actually do something, you remember it better than just reading about it. So practicing democracy, even if it fails under capitalism, because these enterprises are, as Gar was indicating, as wonderful and as, it, you know, we're in favor of them, they are, in a sense, doomed because they're working inside a capitalist structure. But, you know, they need you to have a new uh, consciousness about your power and about what you're doing. This is all part of the transition. How can we trans? Like, the, well, this is sort of the intermediate step. One way is to see the, the new way to see the ballot box, the voting. Voting no longer is a spectator's look. Agree that change is necessary and possible by using our political process as a revolutionary, evolutionary tool. Recognize we can transition from capitalism to economic democracy peacefully by voting for new parties and candidates who advocate our visions. No more lessers of the two evils will waste the vote. Once elected, our new representatives would advocate for economic democracy while voting for the most progressive measures as they arise. What if we had 500 Bernies in Congress? Backed by the 99%, using the Constitution's Amendment Clause, our reps would replace the failed institution and laws of capital to vote in new ones that benefit us and establish economic democracy. We can actually vote this in. We have the amendment clause of the Constitution. If the majority of the people of this country wanted this tomorrow, our represent and we elected the representatives to do it, we could, through the amendment clause, we would say and here's the an amendment to abolish capitalism and establish an economic democracy. We could do that legally. So this is, that's why we feel peaceful change through the ballot box is the way to go. At this time in history, who knows what the future will bring. But we still have these open. We still have the Constitution, even though it's, it's being ignored. So the future, what are, is the future? I think it's two choices. Either we descend into fascism and economic slavery, well, we're getting there. Women are there. Ascend to or ascend to economic democracy and freedom. Remember, we're all in this together. There's no such thing as a free lunch. We're the producers. We're the consumers. We do it all. We run everything now. We don't own it or have a voice in it, and we don't get the remuneration for our labor under this system. Questions? I wasn't here at the beginning, so maybe my question is irrelevant, but uh, how did, if you, how do you allocate the resources that support us? Like you allocate any other resources. You decide what resources support life first. Let's list them. And then we allocate them in terms of, you're talking about the environment, or water, or uh, air, the environment. All right, let's find out why this environment is going to hell. Well, we're, we're producing toxic waste, our industrial processes. So now we can change that. We can change the way we do, do things. Maybe we'll make 10 brands of toothpaste. So you think you can do that now? Yeah. I mean, we, we here, we could, I'm, I'm sure we could all agree on certain things that we need, certain yeah. things we don't need. Uh, duplication, I mean, 14,000 kinds of toothpaste. We know all of those already. 
tubes? We know those already. No, okay, I, I, would just, I would just say use your rationality of what, how you want to allocate things. You know, one Make a decision. Make a list. Get a consensus. A prioritize and vote. That's what, all what humans can do. And without the yeah, without the restraints of capitalism, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, sure. We, 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 well, <laughs> we have a fate worse than that for the one percent. They have to go out and work for it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hi, I'm just a little curious if you have been in collusion at all with like the Zeitgeist movement or the Venus Project. Uh, we're not interested. I've talked to them and they're not anywhere near this. They're, they're all over the place. There's a, a good deal of... But the Venus Project is pretty yeah. much in line with this, I think. There's a lot in... There is some of, similarities. I'm not negating all of it, but then it's... I thought I felt they were too conspiratorial. You know, the world's going to end tomorrow, build your bomb shelter and all this. And it's not where I'm at. I'm not trying to... No, they're about the research. It, a lot of it, lot. It's, it's just too bad so many different factions, you know, well, instead of... Well, that's coming true. In. That's true. That's, a, that's, yeah. a, that's the stage we're in now. Yeah. We're trying to when sort we out what's free, good, free what's positive, bad, what's the ugly. Occupy 2011, yeah. Kevin. Uh, we, we talked to a lot of Venus Project people, Zeitgeist people, and <coughs> looked into their information. Yeah. And we found a lot of their, their ideas, much like you could say libertarians and conservatives and, and you know, religious people. There's yeah. so many values that we could say, well, gee, we really share them. But I think we have to somehow, and you know, these kinds of conventions are important for that. Mm -hmm. We have to get together somewhere and really discuss, well, where are we different? And then, after hearing that, the differences, decide which we think is still the better way and the right. better, more reasonable way to, to go. I right. have a question back. Um, I don't think there's any, any discussion or any argument about the fact that time is money. And it doesn't matter whether you call it uh, money, call it time, call it um, marbles, or whatever. It, it doesn't make it doesn't make any difference. It's still a, a way of valuing an effort or you, you, putting a value on an effort. Okay. Uh, but I think the real issue is overvaluing whatever it is, and the argument. That is the argument for profit, you know, and, and profit is supposed to be a reward for innovation or additional effort or whatever. And that's, and that's where things begin to break down. I'm, I, I'm not certain if I got that out of what you were presenting here, but um, the argument get, it becomes more and more complex as we, as we become an industrial nation where we, we uh, manufacture widgets. Let's say uh, uh, we manufacture um, uh, tractors for, for, for gardening or for, for farm work. And uh, you can only manufacture so many uh, tractors in a year or whatever. And so there are periods of time maybe when there are layoffs. And a person's time, their money, is, is cut off or whatever. And that's again because under capitalism, that worker is seen as belonging to that owner. Right. If that worker right. were seen as a free agent, he'd say, you know what? I was kind of getting tired of that job anyway. I'm going to go into retraining. Right. And as long as we can see that everybody is contributing to the whole, so that if you go into retraining, you're going to help something somewhere. And that's good. That's a value. So no one would be left, you know, uh, jobless, which really means lifeless. I mean, under, mm -hmm. under capitalism, you don't have a job. Right. You, know, you, you really... You I, I understand, yeah, and I understand that as one issue. The, the other issue is that um, there are... We... we uh, uh, take our time, we, we donate our time or whatever uh, for an egalitarian effort, uh, which is supports a collective, you know, like government a service or whatever, like sweeping the, the sidewalk, or yeah. collecting the, the garbage, or whatever, yeah. which is also uh, uh, where your time is money. Whether whether you call it time or whether you call it uh, a 
dollar bill or a penny is, an, uh, is another th thing that uh, I, I call a, a um, indeterminate with, 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 with regard to what that time, your time is. Well, that's Value why that. when, when we think of this time card, you know, time banking, it removes the, the, spe the specific thing that you have produced in terms of its value or where it goes. You, know, you might be working on a widget, you might be working on an engine, you know, but your time given to that project is what gets recorded. And so we've sort of cleared away some of the um, externals from what you do and replaced it with, I've done it. I've created this thing during the time that I'm giving to it. And then, the, and last but not least, I'm, I'm not putting a, uh, I don't want to you know, take over the floor, but the last thing is with regard to investment in new ideas or investment in innovation or investment uh, in, in something that makes life better for all of us. Um, what is uh, uh, what is the currency or what is the medium, whatever, that allows us to do that or to invest in something that will make life better for all of us? My feeling is that we wouldn't have investments. Uh, we wouldn't invest. Because investment means a rate of return. When I invest a dollar under this system, I want three dollars in return. I don't want 50 cents in return. If you save your time, what, what's the difference if you saved your time and gave your time to somebody uh, to, in a, okay. to create a Okay, all of innovation. our production is based on socially necessary production. What we as a society of civilians need and want. You, with a shortened work week, if we all work, we could do all the work in this that this society requires if all of us participated, probably with a five-hour work <coughs> or a ten-hour work. <coughs> the rest of that time is ours. We can get down and use your free time. <coughs> if you want to rake the park up, that's fine. If you want to grow your garden, do it. It's your time. It's not socially necessary time. We're all going to have to spend some time doing socially necessary contributions. And we as a society decide what those are. So They're not arbitrary. But that's free time when, when it's not... So when, when you're not yeah. doing socially necessary job production, it's your, it's your time, <laughs> and you can use your labor time voucher for any goods and services out there. But what if you want yeah, no, to would... do goods and services? Then how is it free time? Yeah. I would, yeah. well, <laughs> this if, is if, so. If you're, if you're basically commanded yeah. to use If you don't want to work, <laughs> you starve. This is no free lunch. If you don't want to take part so in, in the production, well, this is our point of view, too. Okay. If you don't contribute, you don't get your time voucher at the end of the week, or you don't get your eight hours. Mm -hmm. So. What are you going to exchange for in a store if you don't have anything on your and you know, time card? So we'll have some people starving. No, but you know, if they don't want to work, maybe we should. Uh, maybe you we know, what want. What if some people can't? Can't. 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 Just thoughts. Concluding thoughts. Concluding thoughts. Concluding thoughts. Uh, yeah, this uh, issue of, of free time, um, I did a comprehensive analysis of human needs, and I'm going to be presenting it actually on um, Saturday at 4 o'clock on when is a new constitution necessary, basically. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And as part of that analysis, when I was looking at you know, the paid labor uh, aspect of our lives or uh, time, Necessary, socially necessary labor time, which I've actually created a new category called human uh, n uh, human uh, necessary activity. What is actually the time devoted to necessary activity, meaning needs, and not so much wants. But in terms of um, that, that distinction, I think it's really important to know
not just save free time. Because there are other really fundamental essentials to meeting our human needs that we do outside of our paid labor time. And they are, obviously, the maintenance of self and family. And they are also lifelong learning and education. And they are participating in our civic institutions and democracy. And so to say that, and, and then of course there is this free time category. But I would argue that those other areas, like taking care of ourselves and our family, responsibilities, right. and we have to taking care of ourselves and our family, duties actually to do that, and also to uh, lifelong learning and to civic engagement are things that we should not just lump into free no, time. You're absolutely right. We just don't have the time to do all that. But you're right. I mean, I absolutely agree. Yeah. You can, we can define what free time is yeah. in a lot of ways. Oh, free time is yeah. your time, but I would argue that it's not your yeah. time. You have responsibilities as a human being. Well, let's being. see. Yeah, even okay. this okay. leisure time. Right. You know, we don't like right. any of those terms, but right. to, right. to get the idea of the Responsibility. Let's see how can we phrase it. No. Responsibility. I'm going to talk about it on Saturday. Okay. Because, because it's a great idea. Because it's just not free time. You're going to be, <laughs> we as human beings, have we function our free time with responsibilities. Well, to meet our own needs. You'll never meet our own needs, yes. That's obvious, I think. Summary. <laughs> wrap it up. Summary. All right, we're going to wrap it up. Oh, oh what about that uh, Van Gogh? Do you have that slide up? Yeah, that's what I get. I want about Facebook too. Oh, these are the comment. These are questions that come out. I don't have time for yeah, I think I've passed that. Okay, well, what we what we were saying in one of the slides is that what we're looking for is all of us to sit together in one way or another and really talk honestly about what we think we can do as human beings to create a better world. We want a better world. We think we can make a better world. We should be able to also think about what we want to see in that better world and how we can get there. Our hope with our People for a New Society is that we can generate this discussion. And I think it goes on in so many, in so many ways through the internet right now. But I think what we also have to do is have a lot of courage about sitting down and coming to grips with the problems that a new society would have to deal with. And then be brave enough to say it's going to take time. And we have to be willing in our life, because we're not going to see it in our lifetime. In our life, we have to be willing to give the time to do those things that we think are the steps that are necessary to get us somewhere. Mm -hmm. But always with that vision that we are going somewhere. Mm -hmm. And we're going towards a we hope, better society. OK, thanks for Thank coming. You. At 2 o'clock, we'll have the nuts and bolts of cooperatives here. At, at 2 o'clock, we'll have the nuts and bolts of cooperatives, a long-term member owner of a massive cooperative. So that's good. Anyone who wants to contribute ideas, thoughts, problems, go to the Facebook page.